Hello there, and welcome back to our Aquaculture Expert Series, brought to you by Biomin. My name is Benedict Standen, Global Product Manager for Aqua, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This second webinar will focus on utilizing feed additives in tilapia diets, primarily for disease prevention. And I'm joined by our featured expert speaker, Dr. Gustavo Bazzano, founding director of Aqua Lagos and Partner Fish. In this role, Gustavo is providing consultancy service um, across Brazil and Latin America. Um, and uh, he is based in Sao Paulo State. So in this uh, respect, I'd like to extend an extra special appreciation for joining us at six o'clock in the morning local time. So thank you very much, Gustavo, and uh, welcome also to you. Uh, before we start the presentation, I'd like to remind our live audience of uh, two things. This is an interactive webinar, um, so you can ask Gustavo questions um, using the chat function in the, in the toolbar. And if we have time at the end, we will get around to as many of these as possible. Secondly, during the presentation, we will be asking you, the live audience, two poll questions. These will uh, be a question which you can choose a, uh, an answer which best, uh, best fits your scenario in your region. And then these can be used as a discussion point um, afterwards. So uh, Gustavo, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, Ben. Well, good morning for some, good evening for most of you, I think. I hope you are well and safe. Uh, no, thank you, Ben, and thank you, Biomin, for the opportunity to talk to you and to share some of, of the things we are doing here in Brazil. The idea, well, we will talk about uh, using feed additives in practical tilapia diets for disease prevention, but I will uh, talk a little bit about aquaculture in Brazil. Uh, some numbers, some data about aquaculture here. Uh, also, some tilapia issues that we have today here, uh, mostly the disease that we have here, and some resources. And I, I will focus uh, on economic, on the economics of those uh, resources. Okay, By basically uh, showing you that uh, additives not only uh, uh, are used here to prevent feed. Uh, to prevent uh, disease, but also to improve the economics, to improve all of those uh, technical aspects of the production. Well, let's first see something about what we are doing here in Brazil and the numbers, the data here. Well, I will focus my presentation on fish culture because uh, I think it's better when we talk about what we do here. Uh, we have some shrimp production, of course, but fish is what is growing uh, faster here in Brazil. Fish culture is what's growing faster here in Brazil. Actually, we have 31% growth in the last uh, five years. And today, we produce almost 800,000 tons of fish, of freshwater fish here in Brazil. Uh, still, uh, we have plenty of room to, to continuously uh, grow here in Brazil because we almost uh, buy 30% of all of the fish we consume here in Brazil. As you see here, our trade balance is negative here. Uh, we, we are growing in exports, but we are still buying a lot of fish. Mostly we buy here salmon, sardine, hake, and cod. Salmon from Chile, and salmon is one of the, the fish that people really like here in Brazil. It's not easy to to substitute salmon uh, here in Brazil. But anyway, uh, I am preparing some information now for what will become the first salmon uh, fish farm here in Brazil. So yes, probably we will start to produce salmon in Ras system here in Brazil really soon. Uh, when, we, when we see our aquaculture, uh, it's really uh, interesting to see most of our production in the Midwest region of Brazil. We have uh, some people producing, a lot of people actually producing fish here in the south region, but as the climate, uh, the water temperature is not so good here, people are migrating and starting to produce here in the Midwest, in the Midwest region. It's interesting, but because the same happened with poultry production, 
with uh, swine production. People started to produce here, but then they migrate here because here is where we have a lot of grain production. Here is what we have is where we have a lot of actually the, the good temperature uh, always ranging from 24 to 29 degrees Celsius. So it is perfect for tilapia and it's perfect for some of our native species. So, well, uh, we go almost 5% from 2019 to 2018 to 2019. And tilapia remains the leader among the most produced species in the country. Actually, tilapia, most of the tilapia is uh, still uh, produced here in southeast region of Brazil. And uh, we have uh, one point, an important point here. When we see this area, this area is Amazon Basin, and it, it is forbidden to produce exotic species here in Amazon. So uh, here people produce native species, and because of that, tilapia is, uh, is being produced here in southeast production in Southeast region. Uh, we have a tilapia production of uh, more than 500 tons and 57% of our entire production is tilapia. We are growing from 8 to 10% in tilapia production every year and because of that we are, well, some people have different data but uh, we are the fourth largest tilapia producers just after, if I'm not mistaken, China uh, Indonesia and Egypt, all right? Well, when we talk about native species, as I said, most of it are being produced here in North region, uh, near to the Amazon basin, and it's really uh, shrinking a little bit uh, in the last five years. Uh, native species are being uh, used and consumed locally. Uh, people from the southeast and south regions in Brazil really don't like uh, native species. Well, some like, of course, but they prefer tilapia. Tilapia is, uh, is, was chosen as the, as the fish to eat here in Brazil. So as yes, it shrink or drop it almost 2% and to, from 2018 to 2019. But anyway, uh, there are some very interesting fish among those native fish that can be really interesting uh, to produce in the future. Let's see some of them. One uh, fish that we have here, we call it round fishy. We have several species uh, with, that we call round fishes. This is tambaqui. I know that in Asia, some people are producing pacu. Pacu is also a South American fish and it's uh, very similar to the tambaqui. It grows really fast, it goes from uh, fingerling to 1.4, 1.5 kilograms in, in eight months, if you have the right temperature and the right feed, of course. But this is the number one native species that we produce here in Brazil. We have also our catfishes. In our catfishes, we have several different catfishes. Most of the fish, those kind of fish are produced in Midwest region, and we have with several different spots. This is the pintado, as we say, and people like it, but it have a lot of spine, so people sometimes uh, don't like to eat uh, the fish uh, when uh, mostly for 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 children, and. Well, but anyway, uh, some people, some local people in some places like to, to, to eat this fish. And we have the piragucu, and this is one really interesting species, and we can see some tambaquis in the back. Uh, piragucu is a fish that grows really fast. It goes from 100 grams to 8 kilograms in one year. So it's a carnivorous fish. And Another thing that is really interesting in, in this fish is uh, it is air, air breathing. So uh, it really tolerates low levels of oxygen, low levels, high levels of ammonia. Uh, the, it, it have a really interesting white uh, kind of filet. So people like it very much. Uh, some people are spotting it. We, here we, sh we call it piragucu. Uh, it's a arapayama but 
uh, other people uh, in South America call it for different names. But people are starting to use this fish in RAS, so probably it will grow uh, really fast in the next years. So we have also some exotic species being produced here in Brazil. Uh, almost 5% of the fish that we produce here are carps, panga, and trolls. It's growing fast because a lot of people are starting to produce pangasius, mostly here in the Northeast region. Well, we have, this is the line between uh, Amazon Basin and the rest of Brazil. So people are producing it here. Uh, people like the, the, the texture of the meat. We have another fish here uh, that is our, uh, our native catfish and Pangasius looks like uh, this kind of, of native uh, catfish. So people like to produce it here and it is growing uh, really fast. We are allowed to produce Panga uh, only in the last uh, three years, four years. So it's growing really fast. And here in South region, mostly because of temperatures, people uh, produce a lot of carp. So uh, it's the fish that you know. Uh, pangasios and and carps and truths, the regular ones. Well, actually here in Brazil, we produce different species and different and several different production systems. Most of the people that are producing tilapia today here in Brazil, they are producing in open ponds, different shapes, uh, different uh, equipments, uh, different levels, different levels of technology but mostly nerve ponds. Actually, Paraná is the state in Brazil that produces tilapia, is the number one to, to in, in tilapia production. They produce mostly here in this kind of open ponds. They usually produce tilapia in a stocking density of six kilograms per square meter per year. So uh, it's uh, using most of the time a lot of aeration and some water exchange, but this is the way that Brazilians are producing tilapia mostly here in Brazil. Of course, we have caves, and as we have a lot of water, a lot of reservoirs uh, that produce uh, electricity, uh, we have plenty of reservoirs of water to produce tilapia in caves. In the beginning, people started to produce tilapia in small cages like this one, but it is changing. People are trying to produce tilapia more in the, in a, I can say in the proper way, but uh, in a way that they can use more technology as uh, as aerators uh, inside the cages, and some of them are using um, uh, artificial. And, and systems that can uh, give or can throw the, the feed directly, not using, as I, as I can say, people to control it. We are, we are working in RAS systems. Uh, it is beginning here in Brazil, mostly in South region, uh, to control and to uh, make the temperatures better to the fish production. We also have haze weights, not that, um, common here in Brazil, but we do have it. But what is growing really fast here in Brazil is more intensive haysways and harrows. Uh, we are changing some protocols to produce it indoor. Uh, sometimes in places that we have uh, low temperature, it is interesting to us to produce in this way. And mostly because we can reduce or we can control problems with diseases here inside those ROS. Um, it's growing really fast, but as you know, uh, the cost to, to, to invest in a, in a way to produce like ROS is not cheap. So uh, the economics of it, uh, sometimes it's, it's not good for tilapia. But anyway, we are growing this kind of production here, but the, the way that Brazilians are actually changing the tilapia production is in large cages. So a lot of people are using large cages today. Uh, 
they are migrating from from small cages to large cages using a lot of technology some some of the productions here looks like uh, the Chilean salmon production using the same technology and using the same size of ponds and probably this is the way that we will grow in tilapia production in the next years so this is really a, a easy picture to see here today in brazil a lot of tilapia uh, 100 and 150 tons of tilapia in each cage growing really fast in open uh, reservoirs and i think this is a technological package that we are we already have and it is trustable here in brazil but then uh, we have several different system production systems but we have uh, different size of production here in brazil we still have some small farmers in south region we have a lot of small farmers uh, producing tilapia and some native species uh, here in brazil uh, with small cages sometimes and a more artisanal production but what we are doing here we are growing very fast in large uh, facilities to produce tilapia it's very common today in brazil to see uh, people using uh, each inch as possible to produce uh, tilapia here in Brazil. It can be in, in, uh, in open ponds, but uh, uh, or sometimes uh, native species. This is in Amazon basin, and this is for, uh, just for native species in, in an integrated model uh, where they produce feed, they process the fish, and they produce several different species. But uh, as I said, more and more people are migrating to large cages so in the end people used to produce uh, native species or tilapia like this uh, really big with several actors ponds and people used to to uh, to employ a lot of people just to harvest the fish but now people are choosing this kind of production in large cages and there are several companies here in Brazil producing more than 20,000 tons per year in, in some sites like this one. So uh, it's interesting to see that as an intensive uh, way of production, people are starting to have, of course, a lot of problems with disease. Uh, in this kind of production in large cages people usually usually uh, work with 40 to 50 kilograms of tilapia per cubic meter so it's not uh, the density is okay the stocking density is okay but still is a lot of pressure in the environment and uh, disease happen we have several different climates in brazil actually we have 12 different climates in brazil brazil as a large country uh, have many places to produce different places to produce but with different kinds of water qualities and different kinds of uh, water temperatures so uh, when we when we see what we have here is interesting to know that this is the place to produce fish because here uh, we have water grains production and temperatures as we can see here when we talk about temperatures in brazil and this is one year ago uh, average temperature of the of the month it was actually the august temperatures uh, last year we can see we have a pretty uh, wide range of temperatures so in, so in some places in last august we have temperatures between 8 degrees celsius and 25 degrees Celsius in some places. At the same time, in warmer places, we have temperatures ranging between 33, so, sorry, uh, ranging between 19 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius. But anyway, uh, we have different temperatures and this is the place to produce tilapia in native species. 
That's why people are migrating to those areas. When people ask me, where do I, wh where do I start my production? I want to start a new tilapia production here in Brazil. Where do I have to go? Go to that area. So this is the place that people probably will see uh, a lot of investment in the next years. And the, the interesting thing is, it is close to the areas where, people, where fish are consumed. People are consumed here, here is Brasilia, our capital city, and here we have Sao Paulo. So those are the places that people really eat more than 15 kilograms per person per year. Uh, the average number in Brazil is 9 to 10 kilograms per person per year. So here we have 15 kilograms, here we have 15 kilograms. So people here are close to the market and, well, this is the place to produce it. But anyway, with so many temperatures, so many uh, ways to produce tilapia here, it's uh, obvious that we have a lot of problems with disease. This is the mandatory notifications in Brazil. Uh, we have streptococcus with several uh, subtypes uh, and we have Francisella. Francisella, it's a problem to, do, to, to us today because it, it, it is uh, new to us. It started only five years ago. Uh, we have some, some motile septicemia, but it's really uh, not a problem to us. We have Eduard Zella and we have colonariosis, but it's really not a problem to us. When, when we talk about disease here in Brazil, we talk about Streptococcus and Francisella. We don't have Tilipa Lake virus here in Brazil. Well, not yet. I hope we never did. We never do. But uh, we have some, some, some problems with virus, but virus sometimes in, in the nursery, but it's not really common. So this is what we focus today, the streptococcus and the Francisella. Okay, Gustavo, uh, sorry okay. to interrupt you, yes. Gustavo. May I take this opportunity to ask the first poll for our live yep. audience? All right. I think you've introduced the diseases for, the, uh, for Brazil very nicely. Yes. So I'd like to ask the audience, what is the main pathogen threat that you are facing in your fish farm? And please select one answer which best suits your current conditions. So would it be a viral threat such as Telepe Lake virus? Would it come from a gram-positive bacteria, for example, Streptococcus? Would it be gram-negative, for example, Aeromonas? Or is the main problem coming from uh, parasites? So please uh, select one um, and we'll wait about 10 more seconds um, and then we'll share with you the answers. Okay, nice. Thank you, Ben. Okay, I think we can uh, stop this now. So I will share the results. Um, so the results, uh, Gustavo, about 12% of our audience are facing primarily a viral threat. Uh, the largest portion, 44%, are mainly fo focusing on uh, ground positives. 33% uh, say gram negative is the main challenge and 12% are saying uh, the main challenge comes from parasites. So according to our statistics, most of the audience is coming from uh, Southeast Asia, Middle East and Africa. So I wonder if you can make a comment how these results would compare to what you see in Brazil. Well, it's, it's almost the same, but you have to take the virus out of the pool when we talk about Brazil. Uh, here in Brazil, I can say everybody who works with tilapia here in Brazil have streptococcus problems. Uh, it's a really common problem. Some of the people who works in uh, in uh, more uh, cold areas uh, have some some problems with Francisella. Uh, streptococcus is the number one disease here in Brazil, and we have several different kinds of disease, several different kinds of streptococcus here. And what is interesting, it's an old uh, disease uh, here in Brazil. People have it for more, we have it here for more than 20 years now, probably. And some people still don't know how to deal with. And in some places in Northeast, 
it's very common that people abandon the area they are producing tilapia because they don't know, they don't uh, uh, know and they don't uh, actually uh, are prepared to, to deal with Streptococcus. So I, I'm pretty sure that this is Streptococcus is the number one uh, here in Brazil, here in Brazil today, Ben. Okay, so the results are quite comparable. Thank you very yes. much, Gustavo. Yes, okay. Uh, and Streptococcus, it's, well, for those who don't, who don't know it, it's very common to have fish with cloudy eyes, with poppy eyes, and with some wounds in the skin. It's the, the basics for, for, for bacteriosis, actually, but for Streptococcus, it's really very common. One problem uh, that we have here, uh, and I think probably most of the people have it, is uh, as the wounds uh, sometimes go deeper in the flesh, you can have uh, something like this. And because of that, uh, even if the fish are alive in the end of the production uh, and it goes to the processing plant, when you start to take the fillet out of the fish, you have to discard the fillet because you have wounds like this. So this is a, a secondary problem. So sometimes the fish is alive, you can, you can have a kind of good survival rate, but in the end, when you go to the processing plant, uh, the results are not that good. So this is a, a, a problem that we have here. And uh, most of the people who have streptococcus have to vaccinate the fish, it's mandatory here. But anyway, uh, the the vaccine is not functional for every kind of streptococcus. We will see a little bit about it later. When we talk of, about Francisella, gram negative, uh, irradiated fins, it's uh, quite, uh, quite common uh, when you see this kind of, of problem here in Brazil. Uh, different from streptococcus that mainly uh, attacks fishes with more than 600 grams. Uh, for Francisella, most of the time is fishes uh, with less than 150 grams. When you have a severe condition uh, with Francisella, we can see the white spots in the kidney, in the spleen, uh, in the liver of the, of the fish. So it's really easy when you open the fish to see uh, Francisella. And Francisella, it's uh, uh, sometimes a little bit odd because here in Brazil, uh, it occurs uh, mostly when temperatures in, in places and when temperatures are below 22 degrees Celsius. And as the fish is not eating as well as they have to, it's not easy to control it. So different from, from Streptococcus, Streptococcus, it's... Uh, a really a problem because they uh, kill the, the fishes when they are ready to harvest. Uh, for Francisella, they kill the fishes that will be uh, the future of your production. And then sometimes uh, people don't produce the amount that they desire that want to because they don't have good survival rates in the beginning of the production. And what we see here in Brazil, it is very common when you have Francisella problems, even if the fish uh, can, is alive and, and when you use antibiotics to treat them, uh, in the end of the production, you can see that the fish that in some moment of their lives have Francisella will be the fish that have more streptococcus, will be the fish with more uh, other kind of diseases. So uh, the, the Francisella really makes the fish uh, less healthier. So this is an interesting point. And here in Brazil, uh, when we talk about streptococcus, as I said, uh, in, in our summer season, and our summer season goes from October to March, we have uh, problems with step, streptococcus everywhere, uh, in South region, Southeast, Midwest, and Northeast. Of course, uh, sometimes uh, we have less problems in more south uh, uh, 
areas mostly because uh, even in in the summer season the temperatures are uh, not more than sometimes uh, uh, it's not more than than 28 to 29 degrees Celsius but here in southeast Midwest and northeast Yes, we have always, we, all the time during summer season, we have problems with Streptococcus. When we talk about Francisella, we are now in winter season here in Brazil. Here we have a lot of problems in south and southeast uh, regions of Brazil. Uh, in Midwest, uh, when temperatures is more average and more stable, we don't have that much problems. But in Northeast, sometimes we have it also. So uh, when we have to design a fish strategy, we have to think that probably we will have, we will always have Francisella in, in, the, in the winter season and Streptococcus in summer season. So we have to design a strategy to deal with this kind of problem. We have uh, different ways to treat the fish. We have traditional treatment that I think probably people know about it. For Streptococcus vaccination, uh, and we have here in Brazil uh, vaccination against Agalacti serotypes one and two, but we have other, as I said, Streptococcus uh, species and kinds here in Brazil where we don't don't have uh, vaccine and antibiotic. Antibiotic we use mostly here fluorofenicol and oxytetracycline. They are effective, but they are expensive. But this is the way that people tradition, traditionally uh, do the treatment. And for, for Francisella, we have Flofenicone and Oxytetracycline. We don't have a vaccine for, for Francisella here in Brazil. The point is, uh, it's not really effective sometimes because as the fish are not eating enough, so because of, because of low temperature. So uh, this is really a problem. When, we start to have some problems with Francisella, uh, it will be a big problem. But more and more people here in Brazil are starting to realize that we have to use, we have to be proactive, proactive uh, to deal with uh, those diseases. And of course, we still uh, use vaccination. It works. We have to use it for Streptococcus. Uh, it's part of the protocol to mitigate bacteriosis, but anyway, we are uh, reducing fish stock density in places where we have uh, several severe problems with Streptococcus. So five years ago, most of the people who use, who produce tilapia in, in, in cages uh, usually use uh, something like 100 kilograms per cubic meter. But today it's really hard to see people using this kind of stocking density. Most of the people are trying 50 to 60 kilograms per cubic meter. What people realize that in the end, when you have lower densities, uh, you don't really uh, uh, lose biomass in the end because the fish will grow faster, the survival rate will be better and uh, it's almost the same in the end. Uh, you think, oh, you are reducing density, stocking density, you will uh, harvest less fish. Yes, sometimes it, it happens, but most of the time, this is not the case. Uh, Acquire fingerlings for no entrusted suppliers. Uh, this is mandatory, of course. You have to trust the supplier of your fingerling and if possible, ask for ex external health reports. We are doing this, in, this kind of, of work here in Brazil. Actually, uh, there are some uh, partnerships between uh, the academy and the suppliers, the, the fingerling suppliers and the farmers to make everything more trustable and more, more how can I say, honest. So this is something that we have to do for Francisella it's mandatory. If you if you acquire fingerlings that comes with Francisella, you will have problems during all the cycle of production. So you have to be very careful with this. And one thing that we are having and we are doing here, and it really for, works for us, 
is eliminate fishes with abnormalities when we grade it. So when we do the first grade, and usually we do the first grade here in Brazil, when we will vaccinate, and it usually happens when the fishes are with 30 grams, we eliminate all kinds of fish that are not, uh, how can I say, perfect. So fishes with uh, deformities, fishes showing some sign of disease, some kind of, of abnormal, uh, abnormality, we, we eliminate it. And we force to eliminate 8 to 10% of the fishes in the first grading. And we do that because all the trials we did, uh, this fish is still cheap to us. And we do the, when we do this, what, what we saw is those fishes are the ones who will give us some trouble in the future. They will not grow enough. They will be the fishes that uh, increase our FCR. Uh, those fishes are the fishes who carries uh, the the diseases and the features, so we eliminate them, send them directly to the to the fish meal factory. And um, where Francis L. story already exists, we do not handle tilapia in temperatures below 22 degrees. Tilapia with less than 150 grams, we don't handle it. When you handle tilapia, when the grade tilapia will do something with the tilapia, in places where you have Francisella, you will have it again. That's one point difficult to, to, to manage. So we don't hand it. So because of that, in some places here in Brazil, people only stock fingerlings in summer season. They don't stock fingerlings from May to August. This is not easy. Uh, to deal with because most of them process tilapia in processing plants. They have to have tilapia all year long and they have to manage to increase, to make sometimes some, some tilapias to grow faster and others to grow slower to try to, to keep uh, the amounts that they process the same every month. So this is one point here. But anyway, uh, people are starting to use more trusted suppliers to don't have Francisella, not at all. Uh, but the point is, uh, when we can do a lot of, of, of um, strategies to mitigate bacteriosis, to mitigate Francisella and to mitigate Streptococcus. But one thing that we realize here in Brazil is that nutrition is one way to do it and a very eff effective way to do it. So more and more people here in Brazil are being proactive in using a feed strategy. And there are two kinds of feed strategies here in Brazil today. The first one is just to adjust the fish feed before handling on when we know that we will have some changes in temperatures in, in rainfall pattern. So for us here in Brazil, we know that in most of, of our areas, we will have uh, problems with changes in temperatures in rainfall patterns in September. Uh, it, this is the beginning of the rainy season. So people know it. So people prepare and use feed additives or adjust the feed uh, in in July to August to to the fish be more prepared to these changes in September. So it's something that we do a, a, for a long time now, and a lot of people are doing that. Actually, in some places here in Brazil, we have uh, four to five different feed formula to deal with it. So this is really interesting, and it works if you. Uh, if you combine the right additives. But more and more people are doing different. People are using additives all year long. And it works because uh, for two different reasons. The first one is because more and more climate are unpredictable. Uh, so I'm saying that September we start 
the rainy season and when we have problems with changes in temperatures and rainfall patterns. But last year it was August. So <laughs> it's not easy to guess when temperatures and rainfall will, will change here in Brazil. And I know it, it's happening all around the world. So because of that, we have started to, to, to use feed additives all year long. This is the first point. And the, the, the second point is because when people started to, to do it, they realized that we can use feed additives not only to mitigate diseases, but also to improve our economics, to improve our zootechnical uh, issues, uh, points here in Brazil. Um, then the idea here is to show to you uh, two different trials that uh, people did here in Brazil in 2018 to 2019. And I brought to you some uh, really interesting ones because they are, uh, how can I say, very practical tests and people did it in in field as as field trials with a lot of fish so it they it's not laboratory uh, uh trials uh, let's see the first one uh we are talking about prebiotic and selenium organic selenium against the control okay uh people use it yeast and organic selenium in a in a dosage of 0.5 kilograms per ton of yeast and 0.15 kilograms per ton of feed. The idea here was to try to avoid problems with streptococcus. Uh, they used vaccinated fish with a stock density of, of, of 65 kilograms per uh, cubic meter. In, in this trial, people used more than 76,000 fish and when, as we see here, the fish was between 430 grams to nine, uh, almost one kilogram. So it was in the end of the production to see how really Streptococcus will afflict those fishes. And as we can see here in the results, in the results, the survival rate was almost uh, the same. But the size when we use prebiotics and selenium was pretty uh, better, almost 100, uh, 100 grams difference. Because of that, because of the survival rate and because of the final body weight, we have a 23% uh, difference in biomass. And when we see this result in FCR, uh, we, we know for sure that we have uh, a huge difference in economics. Actually, we did it. The fish cost was reduced in more than 5% and the margin, the net margin increased in 28%. So it's not just a matter of, of the disease itself. We can see here, both have good survival rates. The point is uh, the streptococcus was not that severe here during the, the, the trial. But anyway, we can have almost 30% uh, better margin when we use uh, a prebiotic with selenium. And a second really interesting point is when we took those fishes and uh, take it to the processing plant, the fish yield was improved, the, the amount of filet was improved in 2.2%. For those who don't are familiarized with processing plant, 2.2% more filet is a lot of money. Sometimes it's the difference between profit and non-profit uh, business. So it's, it's a lot of filet. And it happened for three main reasons. It happened because in the in the trial, people had less discard of fish with deformities, less discard of fish weighing less than 400 grams, and less discard of less with wounds to do to streptococcus. So this is a really interesting point. As I told you, streptococcus is not just a problem of mortalities; it's a problem for the for those who uh, 
to process the fish and have the fillet. So, so because of that, not only because of the so technical parameters, uh, in this trial, fillet yield was improved in 2.2%. It's a lot, and it's really interesting. But we have another uh, trial to, to show to us. Let's see, uh, though this one is against uh, Francisella. It's an enhanced organic acid versus antibiotic, okay? So the protocol, we used uh, the average protocol, the common protocol that we have here, flofenicol, and, and in two treatments, 15 days of treatment using 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram of biomass of fish. The enhanced organic acid dosage was 0.5 kilograms per ton of feed. Unvaccinated fish in stocking density of 55 kilograms per cubic meter. All right. Again, this is uh, a field trial, so we used a lot of fish. Almost 500,000 fish uh, were used in this trial. Uh, during 100 days, so when we see the difference again against organic acid and control, uh, it was started in July and ended in August. We used 100 days here uh, in the organic acid and 99 days here in the control, almost 200, more than uh, 240,000 fish. The initial weight was 16 grams. Well, this is Francisella, have to be small fish. And the initial biomass almost the same for both treatments. What we saw during the trial, and it is really interesting. When the trial began, uh, it did not begin in the proper way, but we have to use the feed additive as a proact in a proactive way, and it had to be used. Uh, before the problem, but it was, uh, uh, they started to use it when the problem uh, still, uh, they still have the, the problem. And as we can see here, when they started the trial, 40% of the fish have Francisella uh, in the organic acid uh, uh, trial and the control 20% of the fish. What we saw during the trial is and they call it reverted Francisella. More and more, they see fish, fishes that uh, show some signs that they are cured, that they really actually the Francisella, they can see some spots in the liver, they can see some spots in the kidney, some spots in the spleen, but it's uh, very clear to them that the fish are cured. The fish uh, we're eating uh, again uh, as a normal fish. So 16% of the fish were cured after uh, two weeks. This is from two to two weeks. And in the end of the trial, 50% uh, was uh, were healthy fish and 50% were reverted Francisella. It was better than the control with antibiotics that in the end only 33% of the fish was uh, were recovered. So uh, this is interesting because even uh, if the rancid organic acid, it was not made to cure the fish, what we saw here is it helped the cure. And then uh, this is the final results uh, because of uh, the, well, it had a really different size in the end of the experiment. It was more than 200 grams for the organic acid and only 180 for the control. We can see a huge difference in FCR and we, ha we can see that the GPD was different too. The survival rate was almost the same, but in the end, because of the huge difference against final weight, we have a huge difference in final biomass. When we, when we see, as, as I work as, uh, in economics of it, when we see this difference between biomass and this difference between FCR, we know for sure we will have difference in economics. Actually, we did. Uh, here, uh, I used a spreadsheet that I uh, used to evaluate differences in economics for some clients that I have. So this is not the 
usual high it's not return over investment this is actually what we use it here and the 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 difference between the costs in the fish production so it's, it it takes in count uh, the cost of the money that you use the cost of the labor that you use uh, everything that you have to account to understand what you will have in the cost of the fish in the end of the production so those numbers these numbers are the numbers we just saw and with a new information this is the feed price we we did in the trial so this is the feed pride the feed uh, the feed price with the organic acid and this is the fish price using the two treatments with antibiotics so we can see we really have a difference here and because of the fcr feed price and all these old technical parameters we have a big difference between the cost of the fish this is in dollars so for the organic acid the cost of the fish in the end of the production was 0.81 cents and the cost of the fish with the control with antibiotics more than one dollar per kilogram this is more than 22 it's almost 23 difference so because of the difference in the in the price of the fish the cost of the fish we have a difference cost of more than five thousand dollars only for those fish we use it during the trial using the same fish price 1.4 dollars we have a huge difference to in the in the total income it was eight thousand more because we have a better biomass using the organic acid so in the end when did you uh, the difference between the the total income and the total cost we have almost two times better a profit better margin when we use the organic acid against control when we see that uh, it's interesting because when uh, this uh, farmer started to use when the first time they did the trial now it's part of the protocol the feed the the nutrition protocol uh, they use uh, during uh, all year long uh, organic acid to improve the zootechnical parameters of, of uh, his production. So it's really common here in Brazil, people are realizing that you can make money using adjectives. It's interesting here. Well, uh, Gustavo, uh, thank you. Yes? Before you uh, wrap up the presentation, um, yes? you've introduced to us uh, two different kinds of additives, enhanced organic acids and yeast. Uh, but we yes. also know that organic um, additives sorry, are a hugely diverse category of feed ingredients. We sure. also have probiotics, phytogenics, uh, mycotoxin risk management products, for example. So here I'd like to uh, open the second poll. So the poll should be being shared with our audience now. And the question would be, what is your experience with functional feeds and of feed additives in fish health? And please select one again, which best uh, reflects your personal experience. Have you used with positive results? Used with somewhat positive results? Used with negative results? Or never used? So again, we have uh, a lot of people voting now. I'll wait five or six seconds more. Okay, perfect. Then I would uh, stop there and I will share with you the results. And here are the results. So 26% have used feed additives with positive results. 40% have used feed additives with somewhat positive results. Mm -hmm. None of our audience have used feed additives with negative results. And 33% have never used feed additives. So it's great to see that people are um, getting positive results with these feed additives. Um, but Gustavo, I wonder, a third of our audience has never used feed additives mm -hmm. before. So what would you say to them in terms of um, how they can use maybe feed additives to improve their, their um, productivity in their own farms? Okay, thank you, Ben. It is really interesting. 
Well, first we have to understand that feed additive is not a kind of magical powder that you can just use in your feed and it will solve all of your problems. Uh, we have to, to use feed additives to improve the way that the fish can recover, uh, the way that the fish will be prepared to the diseases. Actually, Ben, this is interesting in this question because I was discussing with uh, a farmer uh, uh, one week ago. He started to use an organic acid and uh, to, to, to prevent, to avoid Francisella. And what he said to me, he said, uh, Gustavo, you know, uh, the number of cases that I have here with Francisella uh, are the same as I did last year. So uh, I still have problems with Francisella. It's the same no number of occurrences. But you know what? Most of those occurrences, I don't need to use antibiotics to treat them. Actually, I can see that the fish is healthier and it deals with the disease itself. Uh, and uh, I just, of course, don't have to, to, to manage or to do any, any uh, antibiotic uh, medication on them. And uh, this is interesting. I saw some fish, fishes are dying, of course, but most of the fishes is still healthier after, 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 after some time. So this is one point. Sometimes it's not only to prevent uh, the disease, but to make the fish healthier and more, how can I say, resilient uh, when, the, when the disease comes. For those who uh, don't use it, uh, what, what I can say, Ben, is uh, you have to try it. It really makes the difference. Here in Brazil, it's, uh, it's new to use adjectives, actually. Uh, we are not using all of the, the, the adjectives that we can use because most of, of the people here don't, don't know how to use, how to combine the different adjectives. But I'm pretty sure that those who use uh, really like it. And I, I don't know one, one company that started to use adjectives and they stopped it to use because they don't see any improvements in, the, in, the, in, the, in their production. So, but of course, you have to use the right one to the right problem. Okay, Ben, that's 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 one point. And uh, and one thing that is related to what we we were discussing just now, as an overall remark, uh, we are in uh, every uh, time to time it is uh, we we are in today in an unpredictable environment. That's for sure. And we have to use feed strategy to, to improve the performance of our fish. Now, you can use different feed strategies. It's difficult to, to people to realize that uh, feed is not only, uh, as, as feed is the number one cost in our production system, and sometimes from 65 to 70% of our costs is uh, feed. We have to understand that because of that, uh, we, a small uh, improvements in the feed can make a lot of benefits. That's one point. If you can improve 10% your conversion ratio, your FCR, it, it will be a lot uh, in money when you do that. And it's a small improvement, almost a small improvement that you can do. Additives help with them. So you have to enhance your economic results and really feed the additives uh, is a tool to help you to, to do that. It's a tool. So you have to, of course, uh, it, it, you have to be prepared uh, to use all the tools uh, together with feed additives to make the improvements. But for sure, feed additives will enhance uh, your results in the end of, of your production. So, uh, Ben, uh, this is it. I hope uh, I can uh, help with uh, some information to those who are producing fish and showing them a little bit more about what we are doing here in Brazil. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gustavo. I think that's a very powerful message to end on as well. Feed additives are ultimately a tool to support uh, sustainable and healthy animals sure. at the end of the day.
So uh, we've actually almost hit 60 minutes, um, but we still have a lot of people in the, on the line. So I'd like to use maybe a few minutes to ask some questions. Sure. Um, we've received a lot of questions about a couple of topics, um, mm -hmm. Gustavo. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions is coming from Indonesia. It's uh, how uh, is it best to use feed additives as a kind of a preventative prophylactic approach or as a curative approach? Yeah, that's a good question. And we'll talk a little bit about it then. Uh, the idea of the feed additives is to be proactive, is to uh, try to avoid the problem and try to make the fish more healthier and try to make the fish uh, more prepared to deal with uh, the, 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 the disease. So the proper way is, of course, to use it as an a proactive way. Uh, to, to be sure, to, and to be honest to you, Ben, uh, here in Brazil, uh, we are starting to use feed additives in a proactive way. Most of the people only think about feed, addit feed additives when the problem is still, when, when they, they still have the problem, or, or when uh, they, will, they know that, that they will have the problem. But as I said, is the weather and the conditions of the water is more than predictable every day. So have to be proactive. Uh, in, the, in the trial uh, that we did with the organic, uh, the organic acid, uh, it was reactive. We saw that the fish improved the health and, and they, uh, uh, they, they was cured after the use of the additives. But, uh, I think that proactive is the right way to do it. I agree, and I believe this year they're also using it as a preventative approach, right? So prevention is the best best cure at the end of the day. Right. I agree. We've also received a lot of questions about viral uh, challenges, um, Gustavo. You mentioned that Brazil isn't uh, facing tilapia lake virus, but are there, are there other viral pathogens like iridovirus, for example, where we can draw some conclusions yeah. and some similarities? Yes, we have some iridovirus here in Brazil. It's it's not really a problem. Uh, it happens in some places. It's most in the in the when people are uh, fingerlings or fries. Uh, people usually I know that that people sometimes have problems with iridovirus, but uh, people usually use some herbal extracts, some phytotherapies to try to deal with it. Uh, but it's really not a problem here in Brazil, Ben. I don't know if you have some some uh, data about the use of phytotherapies in retrovirus, but here in Brazil we don't have it. It's it's really not common to have it here. Yeah, I think for, from our perspective, our pathogens are notoriously difficult to fight, and one of the best strategies that we have is building a more robust animal, so trying to somehow yes, modulate the immune system and build up the strength of the animal. Very good. Yes. Um, we've also. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Gustavo. No, that yes, uh, it's it have to be this way. And, uh, it's the, the the point is you have to enhance health uh, to the fish to deal uh, better with with those kind of, of problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the last questions I'd like to finish on, uh, Gustavo, if I may, is uh, different ways to to de detect uh, diseases. Um, and of course, uh, especially to be proactive, we have to know what, what pathogens are in our systems, right? So yep. what can you advise in terms of a, a, a proactive disease monitoring approach for our guests today? Yeah. Well, the first point is, uh, for streptococcus is very easy to see because you will see uh, uh, when the mortality starts, you will see a lot of fish, fishes with poppy eyes and cloudy eyes. Uh, you will you will see fishes with erratic uh, uh, behavior. Uh, it's very common to see uh, fishes uh, with some uh, wounds and head skin. Uh, so it's it's easy to see when it is a streptococcus. Of course, the first sign that something is wrong is fish is not eating as well as they have to. If fish starts to 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 don't behave well, 
during the feed moment when you are feeding the fish, something is wrong. That's the first uh, notice, that's the first point, that's the first information that you have to, to deal with. For Francisella, it's almost the same. You see some groups of fishes with erratic swimming. Uh, fishes uh, stops to eat uh, as good as, as well as they have to. Uh, but it's always the same then. When you have some different behavior during uh, the feed moment, probably you have some problems with the uh, disease starting to or, 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 or appearing. So uh, I think that's that's the point. Yeah, of course, if you have some problems, you have to take the fishes and the, the fish and take it directly to a laboratory to understand what is happening to you, what is happening to your fish, because as soon as you detect, as you can detect the problem, as soon you can deal with it. Absolutely, I agree. Um, we're also receiving a lot of questions about organic acids specifically, um, in terms of what uh, what is the type of uh, organic acid used, what is the, the product, and what are the modes of action. Um, to this, I would recommend that our viewers actually contact the local biomin representative, and we would be more than happy to support and advise on this question and also what other additives may be uh, or best suit your specific needs. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on this, Gustavo. Well, I think there is a, uh, some very good organic acids. You have to understand, uh, people have to understand that uh, there are different technologies between different companies. There are some companies uh, who have uh, some associated products uh, that uh, works well in different uh, in different uh, ways, and uh, it's it, the point is uh, you have to choose a really uh, good supplier because there are a lot of different products. You have to understand what you have to use to use the right product uh, uh, face to face your your problem. Absolutely, I would agree. And I think on that note, we're uh, seven minutes uh, overrun, but uh, all of the information is absolutely relevant and very practical, I think, uh, Gustavo. So thank you very much. But as I say, unfortunately, our time Time has come to an end, um, so we'll draw the session to a close. Um, so firstly, um, to you, Gustavo, on behalf of all of us uh, at Biomin, but also I'm sure on behalf of the listeners, we'd like to thank you, um, especially for waking up so early and uh, <laughs> sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, and I'm sure you've given us plenty to think about. I really believe that functional feeds are the way forwards in terms of kind of building a more holistic preventative approach to disease. So I'd also like to thank the live audience for gauging with the speaker, but also gauging with the polls today. And also it's great to see so many people with positive experiences with their feed additives, and we can build on this in the future for sure. Um, just uh, some uh, two small pieces of information. Um, uh, I'd like to ask after we end the session that you take one or two minutes um, just to fill out a feedback form. Um, just to um, allow us to learn how we can improve in the future and bring you uh, better and more relevant information. This will a uh, very short survey, one to two minutes maximum. And looking ahead, we have the third and the final webinar in the aquaculture expert series. Um, the topic will be how we can use um, additives and premixes to guide and to improve formulation. Um, this will be on August the 5th, and we also encourage you, uh, business partners, colleagues, friends, to also register for this. So finally, on behalf of all of us at Biomin, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gustavo. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.